All right, and with that, we are recording. And uh, this is Copo Live and Undead. I'm your host, uh, Daniel Crozier, and I'm here with the phenomenal talent that is Steve Niles. Thanks for coming uh, coming up on Zoom with me and, uh, you know, chatting with me. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Well, this is, it's nice to uh, talk to some people. Yeah, uh, yeah especially in, in these times, uh, it's, you know, this is uh, probably the best way to connect. Yeah, yeah. I've been using it a lot, actually, for work and just for connecting with friends. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, Steve, you know, first question, uh, always pretty standard, you know, uh, who are you? You know, where'd you, where'd you come from? Where'd you grow up? And how did you get into, you know, music and uh, writing? Oh, wow. That's a lot, actually. Yeah, um, sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah, the name's uh, Steve Niles. Actually, I come from New Jersey. Uh, that's where I was born, but I, predom I grew up in Washington, D.C., mostly. Um, and that's, you know, I just, I really hit it lucky because I was in, I lived in Washington, D.C. when I was 17 in the 80s. So nice. I was right there for the hardcore scene. And, yep. you know, I fell right into it. Uh, those guys all became my friends. Um, I had been a lifetime comic book and horror fan. So when I started hanging out with these guys like Dis, you know, the Discord Records mm -hmm. and, and, you know, all these people, it was a very DIY scene. And everybody, you know, if you wanted to put out a record or put on a show, uh, you did it yourself. Yeah. So when it came, when I started thinking about doing comic books, I did the same thing. I just, I started self-publishing in about 1987. No kidding. Yeah. 1987, 1988 was where I started with just, you know, terrible comics, but you know, I was, I was trying, I was really young, but it really was the music scene that sort of taught me how I was going to do things in the comic scene. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So, so one pretty much informed the other, uh, like a discipline maybe. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, you know, well, one thing, my band members were my only audience. Mm -hmm. So I would torment them with my stories and, and things like that, you know, stuff that is, you know, they used to read stuff that's now been published for 20 years or more. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, it was that do it yourself attitude. You didn't, yeah. you didn't sit around waiting to get permission to do anything. You know, so when I wanted to do comics, I just, I went out and I started meeting writers. I started writing publishers nice. and figuring out how the whole process works. I had no mm -hmm. clue. Yeah. Um, and I was very lucky because I sort of floundered with my own company for a couple of years. I had a company called mm -hmm. Arcane Comics. Okay. And that's where I got the rights to half the books of blood from Clyde Barker. Nice. I got the rights to I Am Legend. Oh, um, fantastic. And then, like, immediately figured out that I wasn't a publisher. I mean, I was just, I, I want to be a creative guy, and I, and I didn't like the business stuff. So I teamed up with Eclipse Comics. Um, I don't, do you remember Eclipse? Oh, yeah, yeah I remember so, them. Yeah, and that's how I wound up getting out, you know, the Clyde Barker art book, some of the Books of Blood comics, uh, the I Am Legend adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah the music and the comics and the horror all sort of went, they, they, they helped each other out. Nice. Nice. And, yeah. and uh, the, uh, the band that uh, uh, you kept uh, yeah, sharing your writings uh, with, that's Gray Matter. Cause I think you had a, Gray did Matter. you have a couple of different bands that you were participated in? Well, I was in Gray Matter and then um, Dante left Gray Matter mm -hmm. and he was the drummer. So Jeff Nelson from Minor Threat and Discord joined nice. joined us, and we we became a band called Three. Oh, and okay. We toured a little bit, put out one album, and then we split up, and then Gray Matter got back together. But the two bands really the the, the difference was the drummer. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I've uh, like uh, about the same time that I met up with you, uh, I met uh, Ian McKay in person. He, he did a spoken word thing here in um, uh, at uh, the Tattered Cover downtown. And uh, that was ab absolutely uh, just uh, delightful. Uh, he's, he's so exuberant and very into, you know, whatever you know, you're doing. 
um, as well as whatever he's doing. And uh, you had some, I remember you had some very uh, nice things to say about him. And uh, when I finally met him, uh, that was very accurate. Yeah, yeah, he's a really good guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, last year, um, I had been getting bugged by a couple friends of mine, Rick Remender and Eric Stevenson from Ooh, the Image, yeah. have, have been asking me for years to write a comic about my days playing music. Oh. And I just, for years, I just couldn't do it because I, I couldn't yeah. figure out a way in. I just couldn't mm -hmm. figure out how to do it. And, uh, you know, about eight months ago, I figured out how to do it. Oh. And I sat down and I wrote a 115 page graphic novel called Swan Street. Oh, and wow. It's being worked on right now. Oh, fantastic. Um, it'll be my first nonfiction uh, release. Oh, um, but I had to write, I had to write Ian to ask him yeah. if it was okay if I used him. Cause yeah, I mean, he's, he's all through my life you know, playing music and being in DC and stuff. So I had to get permission. He was great. So like, yeah, just make sure you send me a copy. That's great. So. Uh, that, that's wonderful. I, I can't wait to read that book. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely jazzed on, you know, nonfiction and, and kind of slice of life, you know, kind of stuff. And uh, oh, so, like that. yeah, that, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, you know, well, in, and with the, the state of the, the comic book industry right now, as is, you know, um, everything else with uh, this pandemic, you know, everything's kind of in massive shuffle. So uh, I'd imagine, yeah. you know, that, that project might be delayed being published if, if um, unless um, I'm overreaching. Right um, actually, because we're basically, we're going to do it for image. Oh, so cool. it's completely created around um, the artists that I'm working with on it. Uh, his name is Nate Powell, and he's working on it. Cool. I, you know, because we're all, we've, we've got nothing to do. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, okay. uh, so he's, he's actually working on that uh, along with some other projects. Um, most people I know are trying to work, mm -hmm. um, but man, it's tough. It's yeah. really tough. Yeah. You know, not only, you know, like I have a couple jobs and I'm almost at the end of those. But aside from that, I don't know what I was thinking. I actually thought like, oh, with all this time, you know, I'll, I'll finally write that screenplay I've been meaning to. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, nothing. nothing. I, oh. I'm like, I've been brain dead for the oh, entire no. time. <laughs> so, I'm, oh. hoping as, I'm hoping as this thing goes on, yeah. uh, you know, the stress will decrease a little bit and maybe actually be able to get a little more creative. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I totally understand it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it can be kind of, you know, infuriating and, and the anxiety is just getting at everybody. Yeah. I mean, I'd be making a real effort to just keep the news off. Oh, so just realize yeah, between news and, and social media, yeah. it's just, it's getting pounded over your head. And I just, you know, I, I watch news like once a day and that's it. Okay. That's good. The, that's probably good. Uh, I unfortunately engage with it too much and uh, it takes me down rabbit holes. Um, yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, so with, uh, you know, with your, 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 your publishing house, um, yeah, that you initially, you know, started out with, you know, what, what made you realize just to focus on the, the creative? Uh, was it, um, you know, oh, was it just, just hor horrible business okay. I, you know, on top of being horrible, I had no interest in it. Mm. All my interest in this stuff was creative. Yeah. You know, I wanted to write, I to work with artists. I want to do these things. So in a way I sort of, I misunderstood what being a publisher really was, right. you know, but yeah. I, I was 19, you know, I was 19, wow. 20 years old. So I yeah. had no clue what I was doing. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it kind of, I, I did it the hard way. We, had, we stayed afloat for two years um, we did a book called Fly in My Eye, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big, thick, 200-page book. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, but there used to be these books of blood lithographs. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we published those. Nice. Wow. So, but it was just, you know, I, you try to do both, and I had no time to do the creative, so that's why I wound up working with Eclipse. Okay. And then I was, I was just an editor or whatever you wanted to call me, a writer. I would just adapt stuff. and. 
much more comfortable in that role. I just, mm -hmm. I don't like business at all. Yeah. But still at age 19, having your own publishing company and, and doing what you were able to do and get that licensing, not every 19 year old can, can fathom that. Uh, so yeah. my hat's off to you for, for that, uh, for, you know, dipping your toe in that pond. Oh, thank you. You know, I was just a, I was a little spaz and I, and, uh, I, I didn't know better. So I would write letters to Richard Matheson and I'd write letters to Clive Barker, you oh, know, and I would just tell cool. them, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that. Da, 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 and then they wrote me back. That's cool. You know, I mean, I mean, that's, I've told the story a million times, but, um, I wrote a, a letter to Richard Matheson you know, just saying like, I am legends, never been done properly. Omega man's great, but it's not, I am legend. I am legends, not I am legend. Yeah. You know, last man on earth, isn't I am legend. So I just said like, I'd really like to do an accurate comic of it. Right. And he wrote me back and said like, I appreciate that you're young and you don't have experience, but I'll have to ask for a hundred dollars. Oh, and it cost me a hundred bucks. Yeah. That's and awesome. I the right to I am legend. It was just because I, I really, I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just wrote people. I didn't think yeah. there was any problem with that. I was, I tracked people down through their agents or whatever. And I just started writing them letters. You had the passion. Yeah. 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 That's, really that's nice. wonderful. It, it's nice. I think that uh, it seems like uh, they saw that in you. So that's, that's uh, very comforting. It was really nice. I mean, Clyde Barker, Richard Matheson, John Bolton. I mean, I can think mm -hmm. of all these Dean Mulaney all these people that had faith in a little kid. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was a kid then, you know, and just the fact that they had the faith in me to stick with it. I mean, it's, it's how I got started. So, yeah. you know, I'm really appreciative of that. That's so cool. Um, you know, with, uh, with your career at uh, Eclipse, um, yeah. How long were you there as, as a writer editor? God, maybe three years, three or four years. Um, I did, a bunch of Clyde Barker adaptations. Mm, nice. um, I did more copies of Fly in My Eye, and I did I well, and I did I Am Legend, and I did mm -hmm. M with uh, John J. Ruth. Nice, you know. And that was kind of the way I like to work with stuff. Was like I remember reading Jay's Dracula, mm -hmm. and in Dracula he has a shot that's Peter Lorre looking over his shoulder, and I knew that was from M. Oh, so I okay. went to the I went to the Library of Congress found out it was public domain, went back to Jay Muth, you know, and said like, it's free, let's do a comic. And like, and, and, and he just went nuts and did a comic. Oh, you that's know. great. I used to love doing stuff like that, you know? Yeah. It's just, Dude, you know. I, I don't think people realize how many uh, amazing stories are actually, you know, public domain. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's 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 some amazing treasures that just haven't you know been able to resurface and, and uh, you know come to like the the public's attention. Um, you know, we, we keep going back to like new adaptations of like uh, Frankenstein and and Dracula, uh, perhaps, and, and even like you know the Sherlock Holmes stuff or the Tarzan stuff. But there's there's so much more out there. Do you ever, did you find that, um, you know, you know, with M, was there an estate that you could, uh, you know, just reach out to and just, hey, you know, we're, we're going to oh, give this a try and see if, you know, get, get there okay? No, we didn't have to deal with any, anybody. Wow. You know, okay. all, the, all the rights on it had lapsed, um, even though there had been a couple versions, because there's a 1950s version of the film, too. Um, oh, okay. But, yeah. It was free and clear for us to do whatever we wanted with, at least to my memory. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I I, I want to say I, I you know recognize like you know some of the uh, the poster art from from the movie, but my my, my I'm drawing a blank. So. Oh, with them. Uh, yeah. Peter Lorre. Yeah. Peter Lorre playing the child murderer and has that great thing where the. Uh, the underworld and the cops have to team up to get the, to get the serial killer. And just nice. You know? Yeah. For the time. Okay. I'm going to have to dig that one up and uh, refresh myself. Cause I, you know, now that I think about it, I don't think I've actually seen it. Oh, oh then you're in for a treat. It's a great movie. Excellent. And what better time to do it than in quarantine? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I know. 
Are you uh, painting Gorgo back there? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I finished uh, Gorgo uh, a little while ago. Little, little mural on wood. So this big, oh, very cool. big guy. Wow, yeah, he's it's, huge. Thanks. Yeah, it's, oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, it's uh, just lots of paint markers. Um, you know, I only had a few. Uh, I think you're probably the, the third or fourth person that recognized that it's Gorgo. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I, uh, where I have a Gorgo model around here somewhere. Oh, sweet. Uh, oh, I, I've yeah, always... I, I, yeah, I've, I've always loved the visual of Gorgo, but I've never seen the film either. So that's another one. I've never I seen the movie. Movie. <coughs> yeah. Oh, you got to see it. It's a classic. Yeah, it's um, my, my girlfriend and I have been writing, started uh, writing and illustrating uh, like children's, uh, you know, kai, uh, kaiju bunny cartoons oh. uh, yeah. or um, comic books, I should say. And uh, so we've been getting back into like the kaiju uh, monsters and stuff. And of course, I grew up with Godzilla and Gamera, but I've never seen right. Gorgo. And there's there's quite a few that um, I'm, you know, as I go along, I'm realizing I haven't seen this, you know, Japanese, uh, you know, King Kong or, uh, yeah, it's, there's, there's quite a few, but the visuals are always so striking. So that's what that. Yeah, that's what I uh, go to. Yeah, well, uh, Gorgo is so interesting because it's uh, London. I mean, it's it's a UK movie, so it's so oh. different than the other. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a. Oh, it's I didn't know that. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> no, you, you, you gotta see it. You gotta see it now. Oh man, yeah. yeah. Oh, that that's wonderful. Um, I've got a bunch of friends in uh, in Scotland, uh, so we we usually do video chatting every every week. Is there working with us on another book too. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, Edinburgh, um, you know, kind of uh, horror comedy folklore type stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it, it'll be fun to let them know that, uh, yeah, your, your neighbors, um, yeah, they're housing kaiju monsters. So you should really be watchful. Oh yeah. <laughs> another invasion. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so, Man, yeah, you know, early on in your career, you know, doing the band thing, you know, doing, you know, all the writing and everything. Um, but, you, you know, making that that leap to uh, like 30 days uh, of night, which is, you know, really where I learned of your work. Um, right. And it was, yeah, absolutely, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, uh, comic. And you know, a bit of a, a breath of fresh air too, I think, to uh, vampire folklore. Um, yeah. You know, w uh, I was really trying. What's that? I was, I was really trying when when that came out. I was especially hostile towards things like Buffy and okay. you know all the friendly vampires. There's there, was, there right. were so many friendly vampires out there. So I was really, in a way, I was reacting to that. Oh, okay, you know. nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's there is that that sense of like romance with uh, vampires, especially like Anne Rice stuff, and, and later, you know, the 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 shininess of Twilight or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the you know yeah the vampires in your story were absolutely fucking brutal and savage. Yeah. And, and is, yeah, just as you would yeah, think a, a vampire should be, I think. Yeah, well, that's I was. I remember talking to Ben Templesmith about it. And I was like, they should be land sharks. They do not mm. give a shit about you nice. for nothing but food. You know, no. So I mean, it was very intentional. We were just like, no romance. You know, okay. Especially in the that first story, we we're like, there's no romance. There's no seduction. There's none of that. They're just out to eat. Yeah. And feed. And yeah. humans are nothing but food to them. And just somehow. You know, that combined with sort of the, uh, you know, them being so secluded with these vicious vampires, just it just seemed like it was scarier, you mm -hmm. know. And that's really what I was going for, because it, it had gotten to a point where vampires just weren't scary anymore. They were, you know, there are yeah. things people fantas fantasized about being vampires. And, yeah. Know, like, yeah, that, that is, know. that that's always something that uh, was, was kind of weird, you know, 
Like uh, you see in some of those docu series about people murdering other people you know, in, in the the attempts to uh, be a, a true to life you know vampire or something like that. Some you know something uh, you know over romanticized. It's like why would you want to you know romanticize about being a, a serial killer? They're the monster. Yeah. yeah, and it's just done so much. I mean, you know, nothing. Against, I love Anne Rice. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got nothing against that stuff. It was just that when it came time, because I had the, I had the uh, Alaska hook, you know, I yeah. had that. And so, but when it came time to develop the vampires, just, it was really just, you know, Ben and I just wanted to do something different. Nice. You know, that was, you know, when we did that, we initially, uh, Ben and I were still working for Todd McFarlane. Oh, and we were on a, I, we were doing a book called Hellspawn. And we were on a break from Hellspawn while we waited for Todd to get back with some notes. And Ten Adams said, wrote me and or called me and said, "Look, we're starting a publishing company. We have no money, mm -hmm. so we can't pay you, but you can do whatever you want." Nice. So I sent I sent him the pitch list, and it was like Cal McDonald, Freaks of the Heartland, um, Thirty Days a Night. It was the whole. It was all these things on the list, and he picked Thirty Days a Night. Oh, wonderful. You know, let's do this one. So Ben and I did the first issue for free. Okay. And then it just, and then it just exploded. You know, it just exploded. But that was, it was really, it was a labor of love. You know, we had no, no clue people were going to give a shit about it. Yeah. So it was I, fun to write like that. That's, 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 that's wonderful when, when somebody can, you know, give you that kind of runway. Well, I've known Ted since Ted. I've known him since Eclipse. He mm. was an editor at Eclipse. Okay. He was really young. Yeah, and then he got me work with McFarland, him and Bo Smith. Um, and then yeah, and then you know at the tail end of the stuff with McFarland, I wrote Thirty Days, and everything just took off. Nice. Oh, that's 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 wonderful. The uh, with uh, yeah the idea of. Um, 30 Days of Night, was that uh, something that uh, you, uh, you and Ben kind of, you know, came up with, you know, while working uh, for Todd? Or was that something that, you know, just kind of, um, you know, was always there, like, during the days of Eclipse and stuff? It was, it was on a pitch list I had. I just said, you know, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't sell a story to save my life, you know, at that point. That's, I was writing Spawn, you know, yeah. I was doing stuff like that. I, I was working at Disney. Um, oh, okay. that I did not know. <laughs> yeah, Disney Interactive. Uh, okay. It was a year. Of, yeah, that's what got me out to LA. Okay. Uh, nice. They hired me to be a writer at Disney Interactive, and uh, it was they were trying to create the animation studio model. Mm -hmm. So they they invited artists and writers from all over the world. Yeah. You know, and they put a two hundred of us in a big room. Um, they forgot to hire anybody who knew how to make a damn video game. Oh, so <laughs> you know, we all sat around like, doo, 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 you know, and I mean, I wrote a bunch of stuff, but nothing ever saw the light of day because nobody knew how to do it. Yeah. So they wound up laying off, I think, all but 25 of us. Oh, um, shoot. And I, was, and I was stuck in L.A. And uh, luckily, um, Bo Smith and Ted Adams came along and they were working with Todd McFarlane at the time. Cool. And they started giving me work. I was doing stuff like I was interviewing Ozzy Osbourne. I was interviewing all the members of Kiss for the magazines that Todd mm -hmm. used to do. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I wrote Spawn the Dark Ages and Spawn and Hell Spawn and all that stuff. And then got that little break with 30 Days a Night. Nice. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, how did you and, and uh, Ben Templesmith you know, meet up? We met on the Spawn message board. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it was when I was doing, you know, working with Todd and he started posting samples uh -huh. and they were just excellent. You know, the first stuff he posted just looked so great. Yeah. So we started talking and when we got that chance, you know, we went for it. Nice. And, uh, you know, we just did the three issues of 30 Days. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Um, so, you know, for anybody who uh, is watching this interview later, uh, those message boards mean something. <laughs> you can connect. Uh, on there they're so they're so nice um oh yeah. i know i miss those 
Yeah. Now you've you've got you know more robust like social media and stuff, but sometimes there's there's so many nuggets that kind of slip away with um, you know the oversaturation of content. Yeah, I just remember with message boards, I, um, I just used to have more conversations mm -hmm. with yeah. people. You know, it just seemed like and everything now is so ticker tape. You know, it all just right. goes flying by so fast. Right. So, but yeah, I miss the old message boards. Those were yeah. fun. Yeah, that's that's cool. Um, so you you yeah, it seems like uh, that that list that uh, that you. Um, um, listed off as far as, you know, some of the pitch projects and stuff, they've all come to fruition. Uh, I remember reading um, um, Heartland, uh, Freaks of the Heartland on, uh, on a plane ride to Seattle. And, uh, and that, was, that was a charming little read. Um, that, that, was, that was pretty fun. The, you know, it, it, uh, I kept uh, associating it to um, a lighter side of like a darker episode of uh, X Files. I don't know if you remember the one I'm I'm talking about, but uh, oh, home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one. With, oh God, yeah, right. that was brutal. It was Mama so brutal. I, you know, back then when I first watched it, I couldn't believe they aired it, and um, they only aired it. Oh, oh, only once. Okay. Wow. And then I think it, it didn't show up again till one of the collections. Right, right. Um, yeah, I've yeah. You know, my girlfriend and I, we've we've gone back, and uh, I think we've rewatched all nine seasons. Uh, you know, it, we're in the middle of it right now. You know, during the the quarantine stuff. So, so it's yeah. You know, that's that's one of my episodes that I always go to, and then uh, my favorite, I, it's my favorite I, episode. Yeah, then the, like Humbug season two. Just because uh, my friend the Enigma is is in the episode, so I was like looking at him before he was all you know blued up, you know he just yeah. figured it out. <laughs> yeah, oh, back wow. when he had flesh tones, but um, yeah, but I always thought about Freaks of the Heartland sort of as a combination of Home and Village of the Damned. Oh, okay. So was it like a directly influenced? Um, you know, it was one of those things I didn't realize it till later, but it probably was with a town giving spontaneous birth, you know, and it, and, but it, I didn't do any of the alien invasion, any of that stuff. It was just, actually, I never explained them at all. Yeah. I just thought it'd be a great idea. Just let people, everybody feeds in their own idea that people right. come up to me over the years and they're just like, oh, it was a curse, right? Oh, it was radiation. It was a bomb. I'm like, sure. Whatever, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. Well, that, yeah. that's, that's good to kind of keep, uh, keep things, you know, that sense of abstract because there, there's also that lingering suspense of, you know, what, what, you know, of possibilities, you know, if, if you define it, um, you know, do you think it becomes like force feeding? I, in that case, yeah, I do. Okay. Um, in general, I have a real problem with over explanation in horror movies. Mm -hmm. More in science fiction, I mean, anything really. I just don't yeah. like things being explained. So with that, I remember, you know, because I had a version of the script that explained where they came from. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of supernatural and all this. And I just wound up like, I don't know. I, I got more mileage out of not explaining it. Because everybody with horror, especially, people attribute their own, they feed their own ideas into it. They're what scares them. Yeah. And, you know, that's more than I could ever come up with. So in that case, I liked leaving it a little ambiguous. Sort mm -hmm. of like in 30 Days of Night, I never explained where the vampires came from. Right, right. Um, yeah, I think that's something that uh, I really appreciated. Um, they're, you know, not, you know, yeah, just keeping things uh, relatively uh, uh, abstract. Um, yeah. You know, my... My association with that is, you know, in suspense and something like like Alien, you never fully show the creature, yeah, you know, until you know the the very end. And even then, you know, it's still so dark and so moody that uh, it's never a full reveal, you know. Yeah. Um, and you can only do that once. You can't put the genie back in the bottle after that. Exactly. That's why I think Alien is probably the best example of that too. They did such, I think, yeah. you know, 
Ridley Scott was so aware of that fact that he didn't want to reveal the monster too much. Yeah. You know, and yet at the same time, they had this fantastic design. Right. So that's a, that is a tough line to walk. The fact that he made those decisions and didn't spill the beans early, I think is a, it really just shows how great that movie is. Yeah. And you know, when you hear, when you talk to uh, like artists and uh, you know, all that design work and stuff, they, you know, they really miss, you know, it's like, well, why not show all the work and detail in there? And it's like, yeah, but does it support the story? There's got to be a reason to, to unveil or everything. If it doesn't support the story, then don't show it all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. I agree. And, you know, as much as I love aliens, you know, and, you know, for, for a separate, you know, because it's a separate entity, it's, it's an infestation of all these, you know, creatures, and it becomes a, a big action play. You know, past that, it becomes very difficult, you know, put, you know, trying to retell or tread new territory. Um, but, you know, it's like your monster's already, you already know how to deal with your monster. So, you know, yeah. now, now, I guess, you know, I don't know, you got to create a new mythos somehow. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, you you've got so many. Well, you've also worked with um, Bernie Wrightson at one point yeah. too. What well, was that experience yeah, I mean, like? Well, you know, first and foremost, we became friends. Um, we became friends years ago, and for at least the first year, I didn't bring up work at all. Mm. I just I figured because I was hanging around, and the first thing you see is everybody's clawing at him for work all the time right so i was just really happy being friends with him he really wasn't doing many comics at the time and he wound up doing um a treehouse of horror with len ween that oh. was a uh a, a simpsons parody yeah. of swamp thing it nice. was wonderful it was great but he kind of got the itch again so he's the one he brought up actually doing the first thing we did called city of others um and we actually, uh, we had such a big plan for this thing and it just didn't wind up working. But, you know, mostly he was my friend. Uh, we, you know, we did five or six projects together, but the highlight of everything, I mean, I loved working with him and all that, but the highlight was we had almost every Friday night, we had Friday night Scrabble games. Mm -hmm. And we just, you know, four, four of us would get together and there's beer and there's pizza. And we nice. would just bullshit all night you know, play Scrabble. Um, and that's how we came up with a lot of the stories. We would just, you know, we would just babble at each other while we're playing and we'd come up with a lot of different stuff then. So, I mean, I, I can't tell you how important it was and what an honor it was to, you know, be friends with him and, and be able to work with him. It's just mm -hmm. incredible. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. The, um, with your, your writing process too, is it, different project to project um like obviously 30 days of night was more you know coming up seems like more of coming up with that hook and and then just pitch and get the green light to actually write it it seems like but um yeah. is it just more conversational collaborative between you know your partners um or is it you know just change and it really is project to project it's different um with every project the only thing that has really changed um is in the last five years, believe it or not, I never used to outline anything. Mm. I used to like, I would like scribble all these, you know, like this, like a serial killer all over these, all over a piece of paper. And somehow I had managed to remember that that was a story. Um, and then I started talking to Mark Miller and he had a couple really good uh, suggestions. And one, one, I used to do this all the time because I'd have four books going at once. I would write a first issue and then another first issue and, and I would jump around uh, on issues. And he finally was like, man, I do so much better when I just write one thing all the way through. Mm. Just, put everything in, you know, work it out so you can, you don't have to jump around. So I started doing that yeah. and getting much better. Results. And then I never used to really do detailed outlines. And I started, I actually, you know, at Mark's suggestion, started doing it and it's changed everything you nice. know i can get all these ideas out mm -hmm. and then when it comes to sitting down and doing the script half the stress is gone 
Yeah. Because I used to just fly by the seat of my pants like an idiot, you mm-hmm. know. And now I just realize, oh, map it out first. Then you don't have to stress out, you know, all the time. So yeah. that's been a that's been the biggest change in my creative process. That I, you know, I do lay everything out beforehand now. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, I, I totally understand, you know, that doing everything by the seat of your pants approach. Cause I think I still do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you, you have so many ideas and you kind of want to grab at them all at the same time. And then, yeah, that's, that can be problematic, but um, you know, doing it, you know, you know, outline or, or um, you know, writing the story all, all the way through. Yeah. Um, seems like, um, uh, you know, a little bit more of an anxiety, you know, reliever, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. yeah that's exactly what it is. You get it all out, get it mapped on paper. Then you don't have to stress about it. Cause I used to just walk around and just be thinking about a story like 24 mm-hmm. hours a day until I finally sat down and wrote it. Yeah. You know, this, it's just, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good idea. I know a lot of people are against outlines, mm. but I like, them. I like them. They're, they're a great tool to have, you know, if, if you've got that, uh, you know, that foresight to, to map it out. Um, mm-hmm. Even, you know, even uh, in, in like the, the um, filmmaking world, especially I noticed with like make, doing documentaries, uh, you're, you're constantly, you know, editing, filming, outlining and scripting and and those are constantly changing as as you go too so yeah so that's yeah that's pretty interesting because um i find if if i'm sitting there writing um you know i walk away from it for a couple of days sometimes i i can't remember what the hell i wrote so having a, an outline and and granted it's probably just notes so it's like oh okay yeah, that's where I'm at. That's what happened before. So I don't have to go back and, you know, reread the whole freaking script. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how I used to do it. Cause I used to have like four or five books going at once. Mm. And I just juggled, wow. juggled them. I remembered where everything was. And I, you know, I think I just burned myself out doing it that way. Yeah. You know, this is, it's, it's more relaxing, you know? Yeah. And actually, I, I think the books are better too. I think it's working a little better. That's, that's good. When, when you're, um, you know, writing too, I mean, you've got your, your collaborative, collaborative, I can't talk all of a sudden, collaborative, uh, um, you know, partner, your artist that you're working with. Um, you know, do you find that you're, you're writing, you know, to the strengths of, of that artist or um, is it, you know, this is the story, see what we can fit, or is it kind of a little bit of both? I usually try to tailor it to the artist. I usually know what artists I'm working with when I sit down to outline something. So like I just did two books with uh, Scott Hampton mm, and nice. Scott's got that very painterly style, yeah. uh, very cinematic. Um, so it really changes the way you do things. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, each artist is very, is very, very different, but I, I do try to play to their strengths. I also, I like them to contribute to the story. Okay. Uh, nice. Scott, gives, I, I send Scott, you know, the outline and he comes back with all his notes and ideas. And I try to incorporate as many as I can that work. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody I work with is the same way. I'm like, I've even had artists where I'm like, send me images and maybe that will trigger something. Yeah. You know, send me stuff, love to paint and or draw and let's see what comes out of that. So yeah, it's really, I try to, I try to tailor everything pretty specifically. Nice. The, um, you know, recently you've had a, a success with, uh, you know, the October faction and then having that translated into a Netflix series. Um, what, what was a lot of, what was the inspiration be- behind uh, that? Because I think you were, you're working with uh, Damien Worm uh, on that series. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been working with Damien for years now. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was odd because when I started October faction, I knew I wanted to do some monster hunting. But okay. I had done Criminal Macabre. Mm-hmm. For, you know, for 25 years, I've been writing Criminal Macabre, which is sort of a hard-boiled detective, yeah. you know, how does, and his outlook on the world and monsters. So I needed to find a new way in. And I thought about, like, I mean, honestly, the first idea was, what if Cal got really old? Oh, you know? okay. And I, oh, okay, but what if he was a teacher? And what if, you know, he hid what he was doing from his children, but his children are actually, 
you know, have powers because he rescued, you know, and it, 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 mm. it's the most soap opera thing I've ever written, really. Okay. Um, <laughs> but each idea just sort of, sort of fed into the other. And then I just wound up really liking these people. So I think we've done like five graphic novels, maybe more than that now. Um, but I just, I wanted a new way into monster hunting. Nice. You know, it wasn't just the hard boiled detective, you know, which I've done. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's cool. It, it, and right now you're also working with, uh, I think, uh, John Carpenter's uh, publishing company as well. Yeah, Sandy, Sandy Carpenter uh, has been running Storm King for a few years now. And honestly, you know, the way I've been working is I, I usually pitch them first because I just love them so much. Yeah. And uh, Sandy's just been really into everything I've been writing. So I think I've got cool. five books over there right now. Oh, wonderful. One, hopefully see you later. Yeah, we just did one called Monica Blue. Uh, uh, it's a young adult werewolf story uh, for their uh, Storm Kids line, which is really fun to do. Yeah. Um, I did that and I've got uh, yeah another four graphic novels basically sitting right now there's mm -hmm. some work going on but everybody's trying to figure out what the next step is yeah so yeah, yeah but I, I love working with Sandy I love John you know I've worked with John before we uh, we wrote a video game together oh, um, no kidding. yeah we wrote a fear three I don't know if you know that one. Mm, I, I don't know that one. Um, I'm not a, a video game person. I'm, I'm usually a, the guy that's, you know, drawing and working and building stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, I've never, never really uh, got, gotten into video games. I did. I did for a long time. So, so we wrote a video game that was really fun, but we wound up becoming really good friends, you know, from cool. it. And, uh, you know, I see him all the time. And uh, I just, I love working for Sandy. She's just, she's great. She's got a great attitude. Nice. Well, and, and with, uh, with, you know, John, like he's, he's got a substantial music career, not only doing the soundtracks, but now he tours, he still tours around. I think he's, yeah. you know, he's, he's an older gentleman in his, at least his late seventies. So yeah. Have you seen, have you seen the show? I haven't seen the show, but I was going to yeah, ask, uh, do you ever, you know, kind of commiserate over, you know, the, the love of music and performance? Oh yeah, all the time. We check in on each other with music, what he's doing, what I'm doing, you know, because I'm usually doing some kind of music project. Oh, I so see. yeah, we, yeah, we talk about that. Um, although I'm really, you know, because I'm like an old punk rock guy, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how to read music. I don't know how to do anything like that. So <laughs> um, it's a little intimidating talking to John because he actually knows all that stuff and composes all these soundtracks. But um, if you ever get a chance to see that show, I can't recommend it enough. Nice. Because um, even I was like, uh, you know, a bunch of soundtrack, how, you know, what's that going to be like? Right. They have it organized like a rock show. So mm -hmm. it's like the greatest hits. It's so good. Wow. That, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, you know, the, the film uh, Suspiria, you see the you know the band that uh, provided the music for for that Goblin. You know they're they're still yeah. out touring. You know still playing that that soundtrack. So you know it's I find it uh, absolutely remarkable that um, you know there's still such a, a an audience for that. You know music lovers and you know people that love the film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I love John. I love his music too. So. Uh, definitely worth checking out. That, that's cool. And and uh, you, you're going to be doing uh, some uh, Zoom, uh, you know, band uh, performances or practices with uh, some of the matter guys. Well, before all this happened, the last trip I ever took was to DC. Um, we've been slowly recording stuff. Oh, uh, we have like four, we have like four songs down. Um, so basically what we're trying to do now is finish them, but we're doing it over zoom. Nice. Yeah, no, it's fun. And you know, it just turns into a big hangout. I've got my bass amp back here, you know, <laughs> and basically it's the same setup, but for some reason, um, if there's no delay, we mm -hmm. can all hear each other. Okay. So we're just jamming around, you know, playing new riffs, uh, you know, we're going to see about actually trying to record some new songs this way. Nice. Uh, yeah. Man, that, that, 
Yeah, that, that'd be fun. I, I think with, you know, the, the current situation too, um, you know, you really do have to, you know, figure out, uh, you know, little roundabouts, you know, to, to innovate and, uh, you know, to keep that, that level of creativity going. Yeah. Well, it's been, I, I've been doing lots of these calls with different people I work with mm -hmm. and just hanging out. You know, they're really just hangouts. We have drinks, right. we hang out and talk, you know, I mean, a couple hours goes by yeah. and you just realize like we're already used to this now. Yeah. It's not like, you know, it, you know, this is the way we get to hang out for the foreseeable future at least. So right. yeah, I love the way people are just adapting to it. I think people are starting to do sort of virtual comic cons. Right. You know, a lot of things like that, chats, you know, and whatnot. So, you know, I guess the big thing is going to be figuring out how we sell comics again. Because that's the thing that completely froze. Yeah. Do you, um, do you think it's, it's going to be something where we start implementing more digital or, uh, you know, how would you see, uh, you know, the comic book shops and, and the distribution of, of floppies and graph and, you know, on print? Yeah. graphic novels, you know, go. Well, I think a couple things are going to happen. One, I, I can't see going digital because it really, it would just be cutting the retailer's throats. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. You know, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants, you know, we want them to survive. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, I think it's a big part. Of, we're just waiting this out. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I think might come of this, I've heard a lot of people talking, is that the, the floppy might die. Which is okay. the individual issue. The comic book yeah. might die. And we might go to a more like a European model, which is going straight to graphic novel. Right. Which I actually don't have a problem with. Uh, two of the four projects I have coming from Storm King are original graphic novels. Mm. You know, the autobiography is going to be a graphic novel. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I don't mind it. I, I kind of yeah. like the idea of a, a whole thing you get to sit down with as opposed right. to like, small chapters. I, yeah. I, I don't get go to comic stores as often as I did when I was younger. You know, I just don't. Yeah. So. Neither, neither do I. Um, yeah, I do you know, tend to, to like, you know, the, the whole collected story in one, uh, one single book as opposed to the individual chapters and stuff. So hopefully, you yeah, know, hopefully that, that ends up uh, being the model. I don't mind the, the individual, you know, floppies, but, but yeah, that's, that's a pretty big resource, you know, yeah. I mean, we'll see, you know, I mean, we're going to, it's really going to depend on, you know, when can the retailers open again mm -hmm. and when can the distributors open again? Because yeah. right now there's no, uh, there's no distribution. So it doesn't matter. I know DC was talking about something, right. uh, but I, I haven't heard very much about it, you know, so I'm not sure what's happening there. Yeah, I, th I thought it was, you know, uh, they were working with uh, like two or three different um, regional distributors and uh, working yeah. with them. Uh, I know some of our local uh, shops, uh, you know, they've taken the uh, time to, to reach out to like the local uh, creatives and, and uh, put together bundle packages and stuff. Um, we've got uh, Mutiny Information Cafe, which, you know, when we have you out here, we'll have to take you down there because it's, it's a punk rock bookstore and it's a community okay. center and they have a great, you know, comic book uh, selection, vinyl selection. And, you know, it's a cafe too. So they, you know, bundle up their, uh, you know, um, graphic novels and comic books from local creators and, and writers and with, with coffee and, gra and beans and stuff and, and uh, coffee nice. mugs. And, and they've been able to, to weather it. Um, We've got uh, like Time Warp and uh, Boulder. They've been able to do like live auctions on um, on social media, and uh, so we've been uh, you know reaching out and buying a bunch of gift cards. Uh, that seems to be a big thing. Is you know uh, anybody that can offer gift cards, you know buy that for for when when you reopen. Yeah, I've been buying lots of back issues from retailers. Oh, great! I, I still I still have my you know. Got my comics. I still collect yes. all my nerdy ass comics. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'm, I've been trying to catch up on back issues now because I figure that's one way to help. Right. Um, we also, luckily, on, I, I'm not sure who the organizers were, but they um, on Twitter there were some uh, auctions going on, and I think we raised a lot of money for, for retailers. Oh, cool. So, yeah. 
That's cool. It, that um, also talking about uh, DC. Um, didn't at one point you were doing uh, a a line of uh, horror related titles there over there at DC? Yeah. Um, well, I did some Batman books for them, and then Scott Hanton and I created a book called Simon Dark. Ah, um, that's right. Yeah, that ran 18 issues. Um, actually, it hasn't been announced yet, but another publisher is going to be collecting all those. Yeah. We got the rights back. DC was actually, DC was really cool about it. We got the rights back. So we're going to be releasing all 18 issues soon. Nice. I, you know, one character I'd love to see you write someday is, uh, of course, Swamp Thing. Oh, I'd love it. At the same time, I'd be so nervous. I mean, you're competing with, you know, Bernie Wrightson, Len Wein, Alan Moore. True. I mean, holy hell. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't even know. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd know where to begin. I, but I, I, I would love that. Yeah. I, I guess it would, it would be, you know, yeah, taking like a, a character like that or, or any character um, that has been in, you know, in the zeitgeist for so long, uh, you know, kind of thinking it's like, what do I have to say with this character? Um, that sort of thing. Um, I always, I always wanted, you know, I did a cartoon um, of the Spectre. I wrote one cartoon for oh, cool. uh, way back and I, I totally did it like, you got to check it out because I just made like a little mini horror movie. Mm -hmm. um, but the Spectre is like, that's a character I feel like I'd be very comfortable with. Okay. Uh, I just want to mess with him. But I did a cartoon. If you get to track, if you can track it down. Is it one of the shorts that they would release yeah. in front of the, I think I might have it. Uh, I can't remember. Wasn't it some kind of murder mystery? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They threw it on a couple of different uh, DVDs. Nice. So. I'll have to watch it then. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Spectre has always been one of those things. Uh, I think, uh, well, I think of that too. Um, you know, when you, when I think of Spectre, I, I grew up with, uh, you know, the, the mid nineties, you know, kingdom come and the Spectre kind of being okay. that, uh, that, you know, it was, it was like that, that Bob Marley, you know, Christmas ghost type thing, you know, going along with, yeah. uh, you know, the Reverend and, and kind of witnessing, you know, the apocalypse unfolding. I was like, what right, a terrible right. Christmas story. Uh, great story, but <laughs> that, that's yeah. kind of, that was kind of my introduction to the the specter, but uh, yeah, being that uh, the right hand of uh, of God, so to speak. But what a vengeful God, too. Um, yeah. Well, that's I like it. Like, kind of keep it street level, you know. He's a, right. he's a reporter, also is a vengeful spirit. And I think yeah. right there, you got enough to really tell some like great noir or horror stories. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, that that sense of grounding that you know. He, I mean, definitely has has like um, that feeling of uh, a ghost story, but um, yeah. also uh, like kind of DC's iteration of Ghost Rider. Granted, Spectre yeah. has been around way before Ghost Rider. Yeah, <laughs> way longer, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I quite like the idea, but. Man, that's that's pretty cool. So, um, you know, since uh, you know, you've been in, in quarantine, you and your family have, um, been kind of um, out, uh, you know, on your property, enjoying the outdoors and stuff too. Uh, have you had time to partake in uh, any new uh, media or content, uh, any films or TV shows that uh, you've uh, really gravitated to? You know, I, it's funny. I thought I was going to be watching a lot more stuff. I haven't really. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the last thing I watched that I really liked was, uh, oh God, and of course it went out of my brain as soon as, it, but the last Stephen King thing on HBO. Oh, okay, um, The Outsider. Outsider thing, I'm like The Stranger, I'm like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, The Outsider, I thought that was really good. I thought that it, was really good. Yeah, I really liked that too. I liked uh, the fact that uh, they kept the supernatural aspects very abstract. Yeah. And, and they kept having like all the characters. I mean, the whole series is a conversation piece, but you know, the characters themselves is like, how do you actually, you know, um, apply the laws of man to something that does not exist by the, the natural laws? Yeah. Yeah. I thought he did a good job. I mean, cause it's, it's a really outlandish concept. Yeah. You know, I mean, Very. doppelganger. 
very, very strong. Nice. Yeah. yeah, and I, I thought they played it really well, and I, I like the ending. I, I just thought it was a lot of fun. Um, God, I haven't, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of stuff like we watched Shit's Creek, you know. That's a great I series. Enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, Ozark, Ozark, absolutely fantastic and just wonderfully brutal. Yeah. Um, but not as much stuff. I, I thought I'd be watching a lot more, and I haven't been. Yeah. You know, I started watching Westworld. I don't have a clue what's going on. Which one? Uh, Westworld. Oh, yeah. That that one's, yeah. Unfortunately, that, I mean, it's a slow burn, but um, it takes a couple of viewings to really kind of grasp what what is happening. Uh, yeah, yeah. Love the first season. Love the first yeah. season was just yeah, having a little trouble with that. And not much. I mean, in like horror movies, you know, the last great one I saw, at least that I thought, was Hereditary. You know? Oh, yeah. I uh, that's that that's a story I always uh, you know tell people or I talk to people about is that is a film where I watched it and I thought it was just absolute garbage. And it's like this doesn't happen. This yeah, you know, this is not how people interact. This is not how it works. And then I had a nightmare after I watched it. I'm like, fuck, this is this really got to me. So I rewatched it. And it's like, oh, the rules don't apply. This makes its own yeah. rules. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. I you just have to go with it because yeah. it doesn't, it's not relying on any kind of you know mythos that we know about or anything. it created its own. Right. So Oh, I just, I thought it was great. I just thought it was great. I, I saw it in the theater and yeah. it was, it, it made people shut up, which I really didn't like. Yeah. It, uh, my girlfriend went inside in the, in, in the theater and, and she, you know, she came back and she's like, I really should have went and saw that with you. I don't know what I was thinking. She's like, I'm going to have nightmares. And then when it finally came out to like, uh, um, on streaming, we sat down and watched it together and I'm like, I don't understand what the, what the problem was. It, it, this doesn't make any sense. And, and then I had that just, I couldn't sleep that night. And uh, I was like, Oh, this must be really good. If it's, if it's bothering me that much. So I, I rewatched it and it was like, Holy crap, this is really good. And this is, this is so fun and weird and bizarre. And then um, we did go and see uh Midsommar. The um, yeah the follow up same director, and yeah, yeah. It, man, that was brutal. But it, it's it had some some really um, uh, similar themes, but just two different uh, uh, drastic different approaches to storytelling. Yeah, um, yeah that's I, the one, I had to see that one twice before I liked it. Okay. Uh, yeah, first time I saw it, I was just like, eh, it's like the riff and I'm Wicker Man, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Right, you know? right. It, it didn't really stick with me. And then I watched it again and I was like, okay, there's some good stuff happening here. Yeah. Um, also, uh, The Witch, I thought was really great. Is he, yeah, um, yeah, I think is that uh, the director's name, I think is Eggers. Um, yeah, The Witch. Yeah, he did uh, Lighthouse too. Yeah, we just saw The Lighthouse. Yeah, what a delightful uh, you know film about descending into madness. <laughs> I don't know if you can believe it. We watched Joker and then that in one night. Oh, good so, God! Did you sleep at all? Like Descent into Madness Festival. We were just like, oh my God! I need to watch cartoons or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I we we watched uh yeah we, we saw joker in the theaters and you know elise and i were just having that that conversation it, there's there's a lot of those references to scorsese and you know his work oh yeah and uh but at the same time it's just like yeah but it, it, the fact that we're still talking about it 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 does something to you it's it definitely ev yeah. evokes a lot of uh, emotion um yeah that that conversation of mental health and you know how yeah. society you know really just doesn't have the infrastructure to sustain and then you watch something yeah like lighthouse and it's just like there's there's no societal <laughs> infrastructure at all I there. I, yeah i'm surprised really. those, those two guys you know uh lasted uh, as long as they did <laughs> through Absolutely. that film yeah um uh, yeah. but, but good stuff 
but the, I, I thought the, the cinematography and the, the visuals in Lighthouse, and especially the, the ratio, uh, this, the, you know, I was like, man, it, yeah, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous to, to look at. And so just that alone, you know, kind of captivated me because it's, it's a bit of a slow burn, but, but the black and white, just, man, I, I didn't even need coffee. And usually those type of films, you know, I've, I've got a big pot of coffee waiting for me. Um, yeah, just to get yeah. get through that, the, yeah. The 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 storytelling is just so sophisticated. I think uh, you know horror films, and I, I would classify Lighthouse definitely you know a horror film, but it's also just an amazing drama, and and there's that ser- sense of suspense, you know that that the the twos. The, the the two lighthouse uh, attendees, you know, their their psyches just kind of manifest as as they descend into that madness. Um, yeah. You know, and, and great character studies too. You know, so the acting was great. Um, but you know, I had never seen Robert Patterson act before because I never watched Twilight. Um, so I was pretty impressed. He's a good actor. He, he really is, and, and uh, he's, you know, since his uh, Twilight days, he's really uh, focused on more indie and character-driven, uh, you know, pieces. There's a couple of years ago, uh, he did a movie co- called uh, Good Times, and yeah, it, you, you don't really realize that's the same guy from Twilight. It's, it's just, yeah. you know, you don't even know it's Robert Pattinson. He's, he's so good at, at hiding in, in his characters, and yeah. And now he's he's got that movie uh, with um, Christopher Nolan coming out. Hopefully, it comes out called Tenet, and then and then the new Batman movie. So, um, yeah. yeah, you know, there's there's all these amazing character performances, but uh, yeah. but yeah, uh, with with the music too. Um, were you guys planning on on doing any any touring or talking about that? No, you know, everybody, uh, everybody kind of has their thing going. Uh, Dante, you know, owns, owns a nightclub in DC. Uh, Mark, you know, is, is works at a co-op that he's part owner with. Jeff's like a union organizer now. I've got, and we're scattered all over the States. Yeah. So it's, we just treated, you know, it's just for fun. We might release something, we might not, you know, but for right now, it's just, it's kind of like a vacation where we get to hang out. That's, that's great. Um, if I think it's so nice when you can do, you know, creative projects and it's just, it's just more le- feels leisurely, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's cool. Uh, you know, Steve, uh, we've got to, you know, start winding down, but, uh, okay. um, you know, what, what kind of, yeah, yeah. Can can we ask what what other projects uh, you've got in the pipeline? Well, um, I can't go into too much detail about a lot of them, but the the uh, Swan Street, the autobiography, is a big one. Yeah, um, that I'm looking forward yeah. to. So I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking for, nervous and looking forward to that one. Um, I've got a few titles at um, at Storm King, uh, one including uh, called Graveyard Moon which oh. is about sort of a, a science fiction story about the future of the, more, of the funeral industry. Um, oh, that sounds great. exciting. Yeah, wow. yeah. So it's, but it's like a space adventure at the same time. So it's sort of like, I, I, I always hesitate to say grave robbers in space. That's <laughs> kind of so cool. <laughs> it's like a from outer space, you know. I don't want people to think that. Um, I've got a uh, Western horror I'm doing with Jay Russell and Scott Hampton called Black Sparrow that we're almost finished. Um, what else? Uh, I've got a couple titles at Clover. Clover is Ted Adams and Robbie Robbins' uh, new label. And I've got a thing called The Grieveling coming out from there, which is a vengeful spirit story. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. And another one called The Possessed, which is a World War II horror comic. Oh, cool. Um, so, you know, tons of stuff. Man, you are a busy guy. <laughs> well, we'll see. You know, well, we gotta gotta see how we're gonna get this stuff out. But yeah. you know, it's all there. So nice. yeah, the last last year or two has been really busy. Good, good. 
Um, and where can people find more of your work? Well, comic stores, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I urge people to contact their comic retailers. You know, they might not be able to get new comics right now, but there's millions of, of back issues. You know, and for a creator like me, actually, that's a really important thing. Right. You know, I have a huge back catalog that I would love people to check out and comic retailers, you know, have this stuff and a lot of them are doing mail order and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Check it yeah, out. yeah. Everybody that's watching this, you know, definitely go out and uh, support the your local retailers. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, I'm always on Facebook and Twitter promoting my stuff. People are always, you know, always welcome to hit me up. And, you know, I'm always willing to talk about stuff. Um, but hopefully when this, when we start emerging from this thing, we'll, you know, we'll find, we'll be able to start announcing when books are coming out. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, Steve, thanks again for, uh, you know, being so giving of your time and uh, chatting with me. Um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, you're, you're doing some stellar stuff. Uh, you know, going to delve more into, you know, the Gray Matters, uh, Gray Matters uh, catalog of uh, music and, and uh, looking forward to the, uh, the um, uh, you know, the new book that you, uh, you've got going out, uh, coming out. Um, was it Swan, Swan Street? Swan Street. Swan Street. Nice. And then um, I'm going to go out to go check out him. Going to need to do that. Oh, good. Yeah, absolutely. You should. It's a, it's a classic. You'll love it. Oh, great. Um, and of course, yeah, we, we can't wait to have you out in September. Hopefully all this stuff will subside and uh, we'll have, have a, a wonderful uh, window to have you out and, uh, you know, you know uh, treat you to, to Denver and uh, all the yeah. fun musings that we have around you. Looking forward to it. It's the only con I have left that hasn't been canceled. So. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll nice. see you in September then. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'm uh, Daniel Crozier with Kofa Live and Undead. Um, and uh, thanks again for uh, tuning in. Thank you so much for having me.